Wow. What a wonderful time of celebration together here as a church family. You know, I, I think, kids, you guys brought a lot of cheer to the adults' hearts today by what you, you did today, and I just want to thank you for that. Now, with Christmas being a, a, a week away, I'd like to talk to you this morning a little bit about the true meaning of Christmas. As we embrace the true meaning of Christmas, we come to recognize the great value of salvation that Jesus brought into the world. And you just heard the scriptures that were read about the, uh, the first Christmas. You know, God has not just provided for us a means to have a life filled with hope, peace, and joy, which have been the focus of my messages over the past three weeks, but he's also given us love. And um, true love comes from heaven. Today, the fourth week of Advent leading to Christmas, I want to speak to you about love, but specifically about God's love that has been given to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, kids, you guys have been to Awana, right? Some of you? Who here has been part of Awana? Yeah. You got, there's a, quite a few of you. Some of you haven't, but, you know, the, the, the Bible talks to us about the world in, in which we live, right? And, and you guys learned in Awana, and, and parents, you know this very well, that the world is a fallen place. The world that we live in is, is a fallen place. Now, when God created the world, at the very beginning, everything was good. God made everything good. And God himself is good. He made human beings as the greatest creation of the world. He made us different. We're all made differently than the animals that he created because God formed human beings in his own image. And there's a reason why you don't see the animals in this world gathering in church this morning to learn more about Jesus. You guys know that, right? There's a big reason. Man is different than the animals. Both the Bible and, and the scientific evidence demonstrates this. You see, kids and adults, this morning, God has created man with the capacity to know and to worship God because we've been made in His image. We're different than the animal kingdom. And in being made like Him, people are given the freedom to choose to choose between right and wrong, to choose between, between doing things God's way, which leads to life, or doing things in our own way, which actually leads to death. But as you know in the story, in the Bible story, the first people decided that they wanted to do things their way instead of God's way. And, and this led humanity to disobey God. And they they all disobeyed God. Adam and Eve's decision to sin against God plunged all of the human race into a state of rebellion against the Lord. And because of this beginning, humanity's nature was tainted, was poisoned by sin, by rebellion. And that's been passed on from mother to father throughout the generations. In the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul tells us this in Romans 5.12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned. But this morning we're here gathering today to talk about Christmas. You see, God gave us Christmas. God in His mercy did not abandon the human race to the consequences of sin, which is death and separation from Him. Because God is good, He loved His people. He loved the people of the world. And in Psalm 86, 15, King David 
wrote about the character of God when he said this. He said, but you, O Lord, are, com- are a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. And in 1 John, the writer of 1 John speaks to us, explaining how God saw the world's people broken by their rebellion against him, and that he had compassion and grace on all of us as human beings, despite our treatment of him in rejecting his invitation to love him. So God made a plan. He made a plan to bring a Savior into the world. His plan involved bringing a Savior into our world to save us as a human race from the consequences of our rebellion against Him. And from the opening pages of the Bible, if you look in the Bible, God begins to reveal His plan to send His Savior, Messiah, into human history to save sinners like you and and like me, like all of us. Like a bud that blossoms into a flower, the Scriptures lay it out. It shows us how God cares so much about people despite our, our, our wickedness as a people. He cares so much about us that He offers us a plan of salvation. And, and God chose a people whom His chosen Savior would come to us in, through. These people whose father was Abraham were known as the Israelites. The people of Israel were chosen to be God's ambassadors to the world, and they were chosen to be the nation in which the Savior would be born into the world to save us from our sins. And then you've read, we read this morning in that scripture in Isaiah 7, 14, one of God's ancient prophets, he, he wrote this, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Friends, children this morning, the Savior of God's choosing, he, he wasn't just an ordinary person like, like you or I. No, he, he was much different. You see, God sent a Savior. And a Savior was to be born as a man through a human mother, but his father, the Savior's father, was to be God himself. That's why Mary was conceived. She conceived Jesus as a virgin because the father of the father of Jesus was the Father God. See, God Himself decided the way that He would save us is that He would take on human flesh and He would come to us to make a way for us so that we could be saved. The name Emmanuel, you, you heard this this morning in the Scripture that was read. The name Emmanuel means God with us. The perfect Creator who created all things who was blameless and righteous, was prophesied to come into the world to save us from our sins. The Creator born of woman would be called the Son of God. Emmanuel, God with us. Now there's a story in the Old Testament that foreshadows God's plan in bringing His Son into the world. Now, Abraham, you know, was God's ambassador Abraham believed in God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and God chose Abraham to be the father of the Jewish nation and the ancestor that the Savior would come into the world through. Now, those Israelites, after Abraham's time, they represent God's people in the world. And those Israelites, you guys have heard this story possibly in in children's church or adults, you've heard this throughout your life if you've been involved in church, that 
the people of Israel were held in captivity and slavery in Egypt. So God's people, the Israelites, his ambassador people to the world, the Israelites, were under the slavery of Egypt. And Egypt represents the kingdom of darkness that enslaves people. And most of us here have heard these stories in Exodus, how God set his people free by providing deliverance, miraculously delivering them from Egypt. Through a series of events, Moses, God's servant to the Israelites, led them away from this land of slavery towards a land of promise. But to get to the promised land, they had to go through a very difficult place, a dry desert. So they left slavery and they found themselves in this dry desert with no natural water or food to eat. God in His mercy, however, intervened. Even though there was no natural food, God fed them with bread from heaven that would fall out of the sky and they would, they would be able to gather it each morning and they'd be able to feed their families with that. And He sent them quail to eat, some, some birds that, that they ate. And, and these provisions were miraculous. This desert was just this dry, barren place, but God fed them. But those Israelites, being true to the nature that they had, they rebelled against God in the desert. You see, they had this nature from Adam, this sinful, rebellious nature that was not thankful to God for what He had given them. So they cursed and they grumbled and they complained against the Lord their God, telling their human leader Moses that they detested God's food and drink that He had given to them. And the story is told in Numbers chapter 21, 4 to 9, of how because of the people's unthankfulness and rebellion against God, a curse of venomous snakes was sent against them. We read this starting in verse 4. They traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom. But the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up to, out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread, there is no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. And they bit the people, and many of the Israelites died. And the people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the people, they were not thankful as they should have been. They grumbled and they complained. And as judgment for their bad attitudes towards God's generosity, God's allows these snakes to invade the camp. And as it turned, many of the people were bitten and were dying from the bites of these snakes. They cried out. They cried out to God and they acknowledged their sin. Oh God, we've sinned against you. Spiritually speaking, they came to an understand that it was because of their rebellion against God that these serpents had bit them and injected them with a poison that was now killing them. So Moses, he prayed to the Lord on behalf of the people. And, and the Lord instructed Moses to put a bronze snake up on a pole. And if anyone was, was bitten by one of these vipers that were around them, that they were to look up at the snake that was raised up on the pole. And if they did, that they would be healed from the effects of the serpent's bites. The Lord said, to Moses, make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. And then when anyone was bitten by the snake and by a snake and looked at it, at the bronze snake, they lived. Okay, so what has this got to do with Christmas, Pastor Clint? There's a lot. You see, when God's Savior, Emmanuel, was born into the world... He taught the people a parallel, a parallel, like it's like a story traveling beside a story. He taught the people a parallel between this story that we just read about Moses and the children of Israel and the bronze snake and the vipers. He told a parallel story and compared it to 
what he was going to do in the world. God's Savior, Emmanuel, said in John 3.16, now can the kids say John 3.16? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Right? You guys learned that in Sunday school. But not many people have paid much attention to the verses that just lead up to John 3.16. John 3.13-15. And you know what John 3.15-13 says? It says this. No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in Him. And then it goes into John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. And John 3.17 says, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. So you see the connection between the story of Moses and that snake on a pole and the people of Israel that had been bitten by the vipers? And when they looked upon the pole that was raised, they were healed, and the the poison that was in them was, was neutralized? You see, when Jesus... What Jesus said here gives us clear insight into his mission and being born into the world and and is why we celebrate his birth at Christmas. You see, the people were dying as a result of the poison of sin's curse, just like the people in Israel were dying because they had been bitten by poisonous snakes. The poisonous snakes represent sin's curse of death, and the people of Israel needed a Savior from the consequences of their sin. So God, because of his love for the people, he raised up a bronze serpent on a pole so that whoever would believe and would look at this, at this, at this bronze serpent on the pole would be saved from the consequences of their sin, from the viper's poison. And the viper's poison that was in them would be neutralized. So, that every, so everyone else in the New Testament who looks at Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who was lifted up on a cross and he died so that whoever, has, ha, whoever looks to him and whoever believes in him, the poison of sin that was killing them would be neutralized and they would have eternal life. Jesus was hoisted up on the cross. He became a spectacle for the people and he was lifted on the cross because of God's love for the world as is written in John 3.16, because it wasn't just an ordinary man who was lifted up on the cross. It wasn't just a person like you or me. It was God who came down to us and made himself flesh, and he died instead of us. God, your creator, took your place and to neutralize the effects of sin that would bring us death, he took the penalty of sin upon himself. And this is why in 2 Corinthians 5.21, it is written, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Do you see that? Jesus was lifted up on the cross and he knew no sin, even though God made him who knew no sin to become sin so that he could carry the penalty of all of our sins upon himself And he suffered and he died so that you could have eternal life. So that when you believe in Jesus, the viper's bite has no effect. The the, the penalty of sin is taken away. And this is why John gives us further explanation as to God's motivation in sending Jesus when he writes in 1 John 4, 9 and 10. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent His one and only Son into the world that we might live through Him. This is love. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And children and adults that are here today, that is what Christmas is all about. For those of of us, all of us, who, who have believed, 
we were all people who had been bitten by the serpent of sin. And because of this, we were all dying. But God provided Jesus as our Savior. When we look at Jesus, our Savior, the Son of God saves us from the terrible effects of sin's bite. And the poison that's run through us is neutralized. And today, that's reason to celebrate the coming of Jesus into the world. It points us to, to life. And we can share this message with others and point them to life too. This is the good news of the gospel. Jesus saves and our hope for salvation rests in Him. And together we stand firm knowing that our hope placed in Jesus, it's not just frivolous. It's not something just to be pushed aside. It's not foolish. We can look to Jesus and know the hope that He brings us is the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes into the Father except by me. And in Romans 5, 8, and we'll close. Romans 5, 8, five, sorry, 5, 5 to 8. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, just at the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But listen to this, everyone. But God demonstrates His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So in this fourth week of Advent leading up to Christmas, we focus in on the love that God had for us that God the Son would be given to us in a way to escape death and to receive everlasting life. And again, just before we pray, in 2 Corinthians 5.21, it is written, God made Him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in Him we might become the righteousness of of God. And I pray that our hearts would dwell on this over the Christmas season. If there's kids here today or there's people here today that have never asked Jesus to be their Savior, God has made Jesus the Savior of the world. And all you have to do is believe in Jesus and ask Him to take away your sin and ask Him to clean you of, of the poison of the viper's bite the viper's bite of sin. And Jesus will heal you and he'll restore you and he'll make you uh, at one with God and you will have eternal life. 